Florencia dice ecología. ¿De qué dice ecología? Well, did you receive the mail from Patricia about the tomorrow? There is, yeah, tomorrow. After, I think I don't know the time. Two o'clock. Yes. Friday. Ah, Friday, Friday. Two o'clock. Right? Yes. So it's a discussion about the problems, or? So yeah. So I think what you have to do is to submit the homework. Ah, until chapter six or? Uh, no, maybe not chapter six. Is probably too much. I mean, that's too many problems. So maybe you can just do up to chapter four. Including chapter four, no? Okay. Because initial problems are very simple problems. You know, first few chapters, problems, no? so maybe you can submit up to the first four. Mm -hmm. no? uh, I don't know where. I mean, how you will submit? I mean, one possibility is to, to put it in her mailbox. So the name is Aida Zade. So you can probably, first time you can just put the homework in the mailbox. You know where the mailboxes are? Uh, the ca cafe, ca you, know, ca ca you know? So as you go towards cafe, I mean, you can draw the map. So there's this corridor, and here is the cafe, right? Okay, here, this side is the library. Yeah. So just before reaching the cafe, uh, you will see there are some uh, mailboxes here. I think prob probably on both sides, but this side, there are some mailboxes. Okay. And uh, the high energy group also, the, the mailbox of high energy people are there, is there. So look for the name, Ida Zade, and you can put it in the mailbox. So we leave it on Friday, the uh, homeworks. Or you look, why don't you do the following? You just uh, submit it on Friday to her, to, uh, to, to, the, to Ida. Uh, directly, and then she can tell you for the next time what is the arrangement. So don't put it in the mailbox. <laughs> okay. Good. So we were discussing the uh, representations. So I hope I can finish that today. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, the importance of this is that this is exactly the procedure we use for other groups also. Right? Here you know already the result, but we'll obtain the result in, in a certain way. And that way we'll be using for every other group. Hmm? So. Professor, did you start the huh? uh, Did you start the I started, yeah. Good. Um, so, uh, remember what was it? Uh, just to put the notation side. So, we uh, defined uh, H is equal to uh, T3 or sigma 3, T3. Uh, T3 is the same as sigma 3. Uh, and uh, E plus minus we define as uh, T1 plus I plus minus I T2. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, commutation relations in this uh, notation. So you see, I have complexified. We discussed that yesterday, uh, yesterday, right? We have complexified. And uh, uh, so the commutation relations was H E plus minus was equal to plus minus E plus minus. And E plus with E minus is uh, 2H. That is not difficult to see, but T plus E minus, when you look at that, uh, well, T1 with T1 will be zero, T2 with T2 will be zero, so only cross terms will survive. No? Uh, T1, T1 with T2 will give you T3, right? right. Uh, and so it's, uh, I mean, maybe the normalization, I'm not sure if normalization is right. I think these are all sigma by two. Sigma three by two. Yeah, yeah these are sigma three by two. And uh, this one, uh, this one is sigma 1 plus minus i, sigma 2 by 2, right? Is that correct? I think so. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure, but, but you can check that with the normalization to get this coefficient. Okay. Yeah, so, so the starting point, and what we are now looking for is a representation for all of these. So in some representation, 
Those, all of these guys are mapped to some n by n matrix matrices. So there will be R H and there will be R E plus and R E minus. Of course, the, from the so this is a linear map, and uh, what we are saying is that since this is a representation, this will satisfy exactly the same uh, commutation relations. So in other words, R H with R E plus minus will be equal to plus minus R E plus minus and uh, R uh, e plus uh, e minus <coughs> equal to 2 uh, r h. In the notes, uh, instead of uh, keep writing this r, uh, what one has done is one has just given, given a definition r h is the same as capital H, okay, in the notes, and uh, r e plus minus is the same as e plus minus. This is a notation. Yeah? And I think the reason why these notations were used is because typing the text every time this R and brackets and so on, it takes some time. No? Mm -hmm. so just to save time, I think this uh, notation has been used. But uh, I prefer this because you immediately see that this is a representation. No? So the R, you immediately understand it's a representation. All right. So the first step was to find the, uh, to, so take RH. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, I mentioned to you that uh, in any algebra, what you look for is, uh, first of all, a maximal. Uh, let me just again outline the main, main steps. Huh? So first, choose, choose a, a maximal commuting subalgebra or abelian subalgebra. Okay. That's the first step. Algebra. So in this case, suppose I choose uh, H to be one of the generators, uh, then you see nothing else I can add to this. Everything else, uh, I mean, does not commute with it. Yeah, I cannot add e, e plus or E minus to this set. No? So a maximal set of commuting algebra is simply one dimensional in this case. This will not be the true in SU3, SU and so on. Uh, it, you know, there will be many generators which will form this maximal abelian subalgebra. If this is called Cartan subalgebra. Is this in na name? Okay. After having done that, then the next step, the next step then, is to find combinations of the remaining ones. Find combinations of the remaining ones. Remaining generators. That is. Uh, the ones which are not in the Cartan subalgebra. So you need to find some combinations such that under the commutation relations with the Cartan of these remaining guys, so I don't know, let me call it X, huh? X is some combination, such that it, this gives you back again X up to some number. Okay. So in some sense, we are saying that, uh, in a sense, we are saying that we want to find eigenfunctions of the Cartan, but eigenfunctions in the sense of commutation relation, right? So that the right hand side is again the same thing as I say in x, up to some number. Okay. So th this are we looking for this? Are we saying that these are always true? These are always true, but wh what I'm saying is that so while I'm giving this uh, this general uh, this SU2 discussion, uh, to keep this in mind, hmm? yeah, this will be in general true. Yeah, hmm? um, yeah this will be in general true. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so this is a step. So, and indeed, that's what we did. You see, the e plus and e minus were exactly those guys, right? E plus and e minus were those combinations which gave back again uh, upon commutation relation gave back again. This. And why do we have to do these uh, steps for? Uh, if you will see, when we go to the bigger, I mean, more complicated algebras, mm -hmm. how to, uh, you know, con uh, this will simplify everything. Construction of uh, all the representations and everything will be much simplified here. So once we go through that, you'll, you'll see the power of this. Uh, in SU2, I mean, it's so simple that you, you don't need to go through all that, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the moment you go to SU3 already, it becomes sufficiently complicated that uh, when you go through the steps, uh, things become simplified, uh, systematic. Things become systematic. Hmm? All right. Uh, so, so this is the first step. And now we can uh, write. 
<laughs> these are, by the way, uh, okay, I don't want to use, these numbers are actually the roots, this eigenvalue. So here, plus minus, plus minus one, right? These are called the roots. This, uh, this terminology will become later. I mean, I, I don't want, okay, it's, it, it has a name, this, this eigenvalue, roots. Now, uh, so then we use this structure to start with, in, in any representation, R of H. Uh, well, I look for, so this is n-dimensional, so it, I can think of it as acting on n-dimensional vector space. Right, because this is n by n matrix, it will act on some n column vector. Right? Naturally, it will act on that vector space. So, the first thing I look for is uh, an eigenfunction. Now, eigenfunction, well, you can always find an eigenfunction, right? Uh, for any matrix, in fact, you can find an eigenfunction. Um, uh, so, the, you, basically, the procedure is, of course, to compute determinant. First of all, compute the eigenvalues. So, this will be the eigenvalues, right? And for each eigenvalue, there will be some eigenfunctions. This is not, uh, I mean, I don't know if you have uh, studied these things, that, I mean, in, in general, in a, for a general matrix, it is not true that you can diagonalize completely. Mm -hmm. no? um, sure. But if it is a Hermitian matrix, uh, you can diagonalize. Huh? Uh, so, but in any case, even if it, you cannot diagonalize completely, you can always find at least for a given solution of this equation. So there is some roots. There will be some roots. Solution of this equation. Say lambda 1, lambda 2, etc. Lambda n. Huh? This is the nth degree polynomial in lambda. If, I, if it's an n by n matrix. So in general, there will be n solutions to this equation, right? And some of them may appear several times. There could be degeneracy, right? If they were all distinct eigenfunctions, then you can always diagonalize. If uh, these lambdas are all distinct, then none of them are equal to each other, okay? So there's non-degenerate, right? In that case, you can always diagonalize. Uh, but if, if it happens that uh, some of them say this is equal to lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, in that case it's not guaranteed that you can diagonalize it, okay? Um, uh, this is, I don't know if you have seen that, for, because we never use that in physics. In physics all the operators are Hermitian. So uh, for Hermitian it's always, even if, it, even if there's a degeneracy, you can still diagonalize it, okay? But in general, since we don't know at this stage whether this R of X is Hermitian or not, R of H, no? Uh, so perhaps, uh, yeah, what one should say. But even, even in this case, suppose this is the case, so you cannot, so you would imagine if it was diagonalizable, then you will have two of the, eigen, uh, when you, you can diagonalize it, and two of the guys will be lambda 1, lambda 1, because lambda 2 is equal to lambda 1. And the remaining guys will be other ones, lambda 2, etc. You can diagonalize. Uh, but that is not always the case. Huh? Uh, what happens is that what you can do always, which is what is called uh, canonical Jordan form, you can always bring a matrix to, even if it cannot diagonalize it, you can bring it into upper triangular. So this part is zero or lower triangular depending on your choice. You can bring it always into this form where it is either upper triangular or lower triangular. So what does it mean? It means that at least one of them, I mean, uh, in this subspace, if you look at this subspace, you'll have at least one R of H acting on, there is some, some psi, psi is one of these vectors, such that it is simply equal to lambda one psi. Not the second one. Second one will, need not be, okay? But there will be always at least one. Okay. So even when you cannot diagonalize, even then, for every eigenvalue, there will be at least one eigenfunction. Okay. So, anyway, so this is just a little digression. It's not important for us because eventually, at the end, everything will be diagonalizable. So, we don't really care about it. Huh? So, but, but I just wanted to caution that, that uh, there's some little subtlety here. Hmm? But ignore that subtlety for because this will never come to us. Right? We'll never encounter that. Okay, so once I found one eigenfunction, then, uh, so let's say uh, we found R of H acting on some, uh, some vector V, some, this is an n, n column vector, 
such that this is equal to m times b. I don't know if do we use the bracket notations? I don't think so. Hmm? Do I use bracket notation? No, I don't think so. No, no, we don't use bracket notation. So actually, then let me just keep the same notation phi. Okay. So phi is one of these. Uh, phi is an n column vector. Phi is uh, some n column vector such that uh, this is an eigen eigen function. So once you have done that, then what we did was to start. I erase that, but let me just write that thing. R H. This is an important commutation relation. E plus minus equal to plus minus e plus minus R e plus minus. See, then I call. I said this are roots, right? And now you see uh, how important these are actually, because uh, now uh, if I now apply R e plus or minus on it, it'll be something. Some some a n column vector. Everything is n by n. this n by n matrix is going to be another n, n column vector. Now you, we want to ask the question: Is it also an eigen function of R H? Huh? In general, it may, may may not be right. I mean, but it, it, because of this commutation, this kind of commutation relation, we find that again it's an eigen function of R H, huh? and that is the way we did was to let's apply R H on this on this state. Well, uh, and then we used. The only thing we know is about the commutation relation, so we got to use this commutation relation somehow, right? So what it is is that you add and subtract R e plus R h p plus R. I didn't. I, I nothing changes. No? To this, I just subtract and add the same quantity, so nothing has changed, right? But now the point is that I can group these two things together, and this one is simply a commutator of R h. With R e plus minus acting on phi, plus minus. Sorry. Yeah. So these two terms, the first two terms, are simply the commutator of R h with R e plus minus acting on phi, and then we still have the last term. Right. So the fourth thing is this is equal to that times R e plus minus R h phi. Now the point is that we know we know this commutation relation. I can use that. So the first term becomes uh, plus minus r e plus minus p, and the second term because I already know that r h acting on p is m times p, so this becomes m plus m times r e plus minus p. So, in other words, this is m plus minus one r e plus minus. Okay. So that our the question we asked was whether this state is an eigen function of R H, and the answer we are finding is that it's also it's also an eigen state of of R H, but eigen value shifted by shifted by these guys. This now this was happened to be one the way we have chosen our normalization. So this is simply m plus minus one. Okay. So uh, so what I call that call it roots. So what we are seeing is that uh, when I apply r e plus or r e minus, this we get again an eigen function where eigen value is shifted by the root. No. So that's uh, how. So we start from uh, well. I started from the state uh, phi. Then I consider R e plus phi. Then I can apply once more R e plus on that, right? So R e plus square acting on phi. And the eigen values of these guys are eigen values of R h. Eigen values with respect to R h. Here we started with the n. Here it becomes m plus one. You apply once more on that, you get m plus two, and so on. Right? You keep going up. So every time you apply r e plus, eigen value is increasing by one unit. But since the eigen values are different, 
clearly these states are all linearly independent right they, they, they cannot they, can, they cannot be linearly dependent because eigenvalues are different right so on the other hand we know that this our original space was n dimensional finite dimensional n is finite so this process cannot keep going somewhere it has to stop hmm? so how it can stop so let's suppose it stops at uh, some uh, value l r equals to the l acting on phi which has eigen uh, which has eigen value m plus l but then when i apply one more r e plus it vanishes because if it did not vanish then it will be a state with eigen value m plus l plus 1 right so how can it stop the pro this we said that this step this procedure has to stop somewhere the only way it can stop is that at some point when you apply r e plus you get zero so then this gives you zero, not any new any new state, it just gives you zero. So it will stop here. This chain will stop there. This state is called so the this the, so this state is called the highest weight state. Highest weight state. So its property is that R E plus acting on uh, high on this highest weight state is equal to zero. Okay. So, so, so one thing we see is that there will be always a highest weight state in the in a, give any finite dimensional representation, right? Now, let us start from this highest weight state. So, instead of starting from phi, let's start from that. Right? So, uh, we start from now uh, the uh, the what shall I call it? phi highest weight? Huh? So phi highest weight is this state. Okay. Now I start applying. Of course, uh, already is guaranteed that if I apply R e plus, this is zero. This gives you zero, right? From this definition. But of course, I can apply R e minus, okay. and so on. And I keep going. So, uh, so the, the first one is R e minus acting on uh, phi highest weight. And so on, keep going. Uh, at some point, r e minus to the say, I use already l here. So some k uh, phi h w. So what will be the eigenvalues? Let's call this eigenvalue j. Okay. Okay. Here is m plus l. I'm just calling m plus l equal to j. Okay. First, the eigenvalue is j. Then this will be j minus one because now I'm applying a lowering operator, right? Which will reduce by one. Which will subtract eigenvalue and at the kth step, it will be j minus k, right? But again, this has to stop somewhere, right? It cannot keep going because they're all in like linear independent states. So there must be, there must be some state, um, uh, let us say, r e minus to the power of l acting on the phi highest weight, which is not zero. So it will have eigenvalue, um, no, then let me not use the l because l i use there. Good. Now you can forget about all of that. Huh? This, the purpose of this was to show that there is a highest weight state. Okay. Now I just start from the highest weight state, and I start applying lowering operator. So at the kth step, the, so this is not zero, but r e minus to the k plus one acting on phi h w equal to zero. So the finiteness is again saying there must exist a k such that this is not zero, but the next step is zero. Okay. This again is a finite dimensionality. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so now, um, so then, uh, so this, this now, this looks like a, this looks like a, a, a representative. If I just consider all of these states, phi h w all the way up to r e minus to the k phi h w this state this set so this set how many are there this is k plus one states right this is k plus one states okay. so this k plus one states uh, i mean our first first guess would be that this this is a representation of the of the lie algebra right so we want to confirm that is it true that this is a representation so we already know that these are all when Rh acts on this, this just gives you eigenvalues. So Rh acting on any of these states 
gives you back the same state up to a number. Huh? Fine? You, you see what I'm trying to say, I mean, maybe I should say again. We want to show that this space is closed under the actions of SU2 generators. Right? Uh, so what we want to show is that if I apply an arbitrary SU2 generator, right, it doesn't go out of this set. You know, whatever the result you will get will again be a linear combination of these states. Right? That's what we want to show. We want to show two things. First, that this is closed under the action of the SU2 generators. Right? And second, we want to check whether this is irreducible representation. I mean, if it is closed, then it tells you it's a representation. Right? It doesn't tell you that it's an irreducible representation. But then we want to also check whether it's an irreducible representation. Okay? Answer to the both the questions is yes. This is a representation and it's an irreducible representation. So that's what we want to check now. Huh? Okay, so uh, so when I so uh, so I'm considering now these sets phi h w highest weight all the way up to r e minus to the power of k uh, phi h w because after that when I apply r e minus they are saying this is zero. Huh? That was the target. Okay, now this set of this k plus one states should be closed under the action of the SU2 generators. Well, we have three SU2 independent SU2 generators. Any other generator would be a linear combination of them. So it is sufficient to look at these three, action of these three. Right? So RH, first of all, we have to do nothing because when RH acts on any of these guys, it gives you back the same state, up to some number. Right? So this is okay. It is closed under the RH. It is closed also under RE minus because by construction, Every time R E minus acts, it goes one step down, right? So you get back the same states. And when it acts here, it gives you zero by definition, right? So this is close under that also, right? Now the main question to ask is, what happens if I apply R E plus on the, any of these states? Okay? That's what we want to check. So let's, let's just try this uh, E minus. So the first one was, uh, the, we started from there, the next one was that, and so on. Uh, to get a flavor for this, uh, let us see here. I start from here. Uh, let me apply R E plus on that. Okay. Remember, the eigenvalues here are uh, what we said. It has some eigenvalue J. I, I assume that R H eigenvalue is J, J minus 1, all the way up to J minus K here. Right? Now, if I apply R E plus on this, it is going to give me some state which will have eigen eigenvalue j because it's a raising operator, right? But how do I know? I mean, certainly this has eigenvalue j, but how do I know that I'm going to get the same state or perhaps some other state which is linearly independent of that state, right? This is not guaranteed, no? So that's what we want to check. We want to check, show that if re plus acts on this, I'm going to get precisely this state up to some number, okay? They're not immediately obvious. No? So that's what we want to check. Let's, let's check that. So I apply R E plus on R E minus phi H W. Okay. Uh, that commutation relation also let me write it down. R E plus R E minus commutator was 2 R H. Right? I think that is what we have. 2 R E plus. Yeah, it's 2 to R H. Okay. So uh, this is a standard trick we will be using always. Yeah, go ahead. Is it always the case that we always uh, find an irreducible representation using Cartan uh, I mean, uh, this way of constructing the, so what this will tell you is that, I mean, what uh, the upshot of, yeah, it's, it's true, always true, but just to qualify, what, what one is saying is that there exists a highest weight state, and from that highest weight state, you can construct an irreducible representation. So when our uh, electricity is finite dimension? Yeah, finite dimension, yeah. yeah. This is always true. SU three, SU any any good, any it will be true. Any D algebra it will be true. Uh, okay. So so that whenever you see something like this, uh, I mean, uh, is the, the only thing that we know about the Lie algebra is this brackets, right? So we got to use this bracket. Right? If you want to prove something, you need to use this bracket. So. So that's what we will do again. The same trick, add and subtract this quantity. So 
haven't subtracted this term. Nothing has changed. So this cancels, right? But now these two things you can rewrite as a commutator of R e plus with R e minus. Okay. So these two things is the same as R e plus R e minus acting on phi H w highest weight. And what about this one? You see, this one is zero because remember this is the highest weight. So R e plus annihilated that, right? That was a definition of the highest weight that R e plus annihilated that, right? So this guy is zero. So what we are left with is just a commutator, but this commutator is two R h. So therefore this is so so this 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 quantity is two R h acting on phi h w. But R, this is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue j. So this is nothing else but two j times phw. So you see, you got back the same state, right? Multiplied by a number, right? You don't get something linearly independent state, some new state which is linearly independent of that. Right? So, so this is the picture here. So R e minus brings you one step down, right? And R e plus takes you one step up. But within the same, you don't get some linearly independent states. Okay, I show it only for this. We need to show it for everything, right? So how will you do that? This is a little bit cumbersome, but let's try to let's do it anyway. Suppose I started with any any uh, any element, uh, say r e minus to the power of say l, uh, acting on highest weight. L, L is anywhere between uh, between zero and k. Okay. Uh, now, now what I want to check is that if I apply R e plus on this on this state, am I going to? So there's a question mark. Is it some number times R e minus to the L minus one phi h w? There's a question mark, right? If I can prove that. Then it is fine, right? Because uh, R e plus acting on this state is not giving you something new; it is giving one of these states. Hmm? By then, yeah, exactly by induction. But uh, you need to repeat. You need to use this trick many, many, many times. Hmm? Uh, so idea is again to write this. So step by step, you do. So write this as R e plus R e minus R e minus to the L minus one. Right, I just separated out one. Then write this as a commutator, and then the extra piece that I need to add here, right? Plus R e minus R e plus times R e minus to the n minus one, right? So I just written, I'm just adding and subtracting this piece. The with the minus sign, it becomes a commutator, and that remains the same trick, same trick here. I see. Now here you use the commutator, so this becomes two R h. But this is two R H acting on that. We know R H acting on this is simply gives you J minus L minus one, right? Because this is you applied L minus one lowering operators, so it, its eigenvalue with respect to R H will be J minus L minus one. So you get so this term becomes two times that times R E minus to the L minus one. But then you have this object still left over. So what you do again? You push. Your aim is to try to push this R e plus back, step by step. Right? Because at the end, when it comes here, then you know this highest weight, so that vanishes. Right? So step by step, one after other. You so now you bring this one step further, right? And this time you are going to get what? You are going to not get that, but you are going to get two times j minus l minus. Uh, L minus, sorry, this is two. What am I saying? It's two, sorry. Right? Because you started with this, you removed one. Ah, oh, no, no, this is this is one. Okay. Uh, so next step, what it will be? Again, you let's do it once more. Then, so again, I write this guy as R e plus e minus R e plus. No, no, uh, sorry. This I keep R e minus, and then I take one of these and write it as a commutator. Okay. So here it will become R e plus. R e minus 
and then what is left over here is r e minus to the l minus 2 right and then again I have to add the uh, because I, in order to write it as a commutator I have to subtract something right mm -hmm. then I got to add that also so that is r this remains the same but now the other way so r e minus square r e plus uh, e minus to the l minus 2 yes is that clear Right, everything is acting on phi h w. It's understood, right? In phi h w, phi h w, same state, phi h w, phi h w. Okay. Now, when I use a commutator, again you're going to get two R H. But now the eigenvalue of this is not L minus one as before. Now it's L minus two, J minus L minus two. So this time you will get two times J minus L minus two. R e minus to the L minus two. Uh, together with that re minus which gives you l minus 1 again correct and now we have what we have done we have accomplished one uh, thing that now re plus has gone two steps right so do it step by step eventually it will hit it will come here re plus will come here and it will annihilate it okay so every time you get you see every step this commutator gives you something which is some number times this state re minus to the l minus 1 acting on phi h w okay so at the end of the day you just get the sum of these numbers times the same state and the sum of these numbers you can write down it is simply the sum of uh, 2 times j minus l minus say I don't know put something else uh, say m uh, where m goes from 1 up to the last thing will be what l minus 2 uh, the last step will be what when this one becomes you see uh, the last step will be when there is only one left here right uh, so so then when I commute, commute it, uh, when I commute it, it, it will just become RH acting on phi HW itself, right? Phi HW itself, the last step. Okay. So that which will have eigenvalue J, which means M equal to L. Huh? So M1, M equal to 1 to L. That is the times the R <coughs> E minus uh, E plus, no, E minus to the L minus 1 times h f e h w. So this is the result of the action okay, of R e plus on that state. So R e plus acting on R e minus to the L acting on phi w is equal to that. This is some number. This is actually a useful number. Huh? But uh, at any rate, I mean whatever it, this is some number times the original state. It's not some new state, you see. This was already in our list of states. So this shows that uh, the action are under uh, action of SU2 generators, the, this space is closed. You don't get any new state. You, uh, any state which is outside this space. It is combinations of these, these states themselves. Yeah? Is that clear? I mean, this is a very, uh, I mean, because this kind of arguments will be again and again repeated yeah, for higher, more complicated algebras. So that's why I want to want you to understand completely well SU2 case because this is the simplest. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so. So can I erase this part? Any, any question? Yeah. Uh, if, if you use induction, huh. uh, actually uh, you said that and then that number is not very important. We just have to prove that it's proportional to the original state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if we just uh, change the statement that we just need to prove, uh, prove that it's proportional to the original state, so then we you can use the by induction. Okay. Actually. So then we have to do only the first step because if we assume that it's true for l minus one. Sure. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. But this will be useful also. This number. Yeah. Because you're using for what you're using. No, actually, if even for here. I mean, yeah, yeah. 
So let, let's keep that. I hope I've not made a mistake here. I hope, I hope it ends up to, up to m equal to n. So I think, OK, uh, we'll, we'll check that. If, uh, I'll use this formula. And if you get some nonsensical answer, that means there's something wrong here. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think it should be true, right? Because the last step, it would be simply when, after, take, after using the combination relation, it acts on the VHW. So it must be correct. OK, uh, so now, uh, Okay, but that is first. So the first uh, the statement was that this set of uh, this set of uh, how many states are there? K K plus one states, right? Uh, so this this set this, this set of K plus one states uh, is a basis for uh, a representation. So it's a k plus one dimensional space, that's what I'm saying. But now how do we check that it is irreducible? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it, it's irreducible, you know, by definition of irreducibility, that there's no invariant subspace, proper subspace, right? But that is obvious from the construction. You ch start from any state here, you apply Re plus or Re minus, this goes all the way up and all the way down, right? So there is no invariant subspace, this is it proper subspace. This, this space itself is it. So it's also trivially is also an irreducible representation. Okay. The dimension of this representation is k plus 1, right? Now the next question is, is it related to, I mean, how is it related to j? j was my, the eigenvalue for the highest weight state, right? So the question we are asking is that is it is there any relation between the dimension and the j? That's the question. Right? Well, uh, there are, I mean, of course, one way is to just uh, just uh, do this here. I mean, you see, we we are saying that r e minus to the k plus one is zero, right? So r e minus to the k plus 1, k plus 1 acting on this phi, we say that it is 0, right? If this is 0, then r e plus acting on r e minus to the k plus 1, here w is also 0, right? So, but on the other hand, I know uh, action of r e plus acting on any r e minus to the l, you know, right? This is what we get. So from this formula, what we see is that uh, from, from this <coughs> formula, this is equal to 2j minus l minus uh, m. But now l is k plus 1, right? So m goes from 1 up to k plus 1. You have written l there to write k plus 1 in the bracket. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, thanks, k plus 1, k plus 1 minus m, uh, times, of course, r e minus to the l, uh, l is, uh, uh, is k, right, because l was k plus 1, so k plus 1 minus 1 is k, uh, times uh, acting on phi, okay. now, this is not 0, right, this was the last stage, this was not 0, so the only way it can vanish is if this is vanished, you see. So uh, let us see. Now we'll see if we have made a mistake in, this, in the range. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, uh, so j minus k plus 1, I can just split out. And this is uh, simply a sum. This, this does not depend on m, right? So this sum I can just write down. So 2j minus k plus 1. Uh, and then here's how many terms are there from 1 up to k plus 1. So that is k plus 1, term, right? The second thing here uh, is minus minus plus, so you get here plus 2. And then you have a sum over m, where m goes from 1 up to k plus 1, which is the same as this term is simply the same as k plus 1, k plus 2 over 2, but that 2 cancels with that. Remember this, this formula, this summation formula. Uh, now, let's see if we have made a mistake here. So I just uh, put them together. Uh, so, where shall I write it?
so that um, uh, number is so j. Uh, so that two is a common uh, two. I can take it out. So j minus j minus k plus one. Okay, the whole thing is multiplying k plus one. And then uh, I mean here also is a k plus one factor. So it's half k plus two, right? Uh, is it? It's plus half k plus two. Uh, so, so uh, now can we simplify this expression? So let's multiply by two. So actually, multiply by two is two, two, one half. So this must this must be zero. Certainly, this is not zero because k is a non-negative integer, right? K was remember the the number of steps you went down. K is a non-negative number. So this is certainly not zero. So the only way it can be zero is this equal to zero, right? So two uh, j. So this is what simple. Let's simplify two j minus two k. No, I have made a mistake here. So I think there's some mistake here. Okay, in that formula, this summation may be. Mm, there's some mistake there in that formula. But uh, let me give you a different formula, different uh, different proof, eh? uh, which does not require this complicated problem. Uh, so please try to check that. Eh? This is a homework problem for you. <laughs> try to say that I made a mistake in the range. Okay, so the range should be such that uh, you should get, or maybe it's okay. Let's see. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, this is the formula, right? This is what you get. So this tells me that k is equal to j plus one. Uh, k is equal to j. No, uh, 2k, 2K no? uh, minus 2k plus k, so plus, minus k. Okay, this is the correct formula, and this minus 2 cancels with plus 2. Okay. So 2j minus k, it should be equal to zero. Therefore, k is equal to 2j. Okay. But the dimension was k plus 1. So the dimension of the space, dimension was equal to k plus 1, which is 2j plus 1. This is exactly the formula. Okay. So this is one way of doing it. But there is another way which is much simpler, much simpler uh, than this. And that is, so I have this space. I, I have already shown that this k plus one dimensional space is irreducible. Right? We have already shown that. So remember what the states were: the phi h highest weight, which had eigenvalue j under R h. Rh eigenvalue was this, and then uh, let's say R e minus acting on this state gives you j minus one all the way up to R e minus to the power of k acting on this state, which gives give us j minus k. So these are eigenvalues. Okay. Now let us take, and this is a irreducible representation. Now let us take the trace in this space, in this k plus one dimensional space. So this is a trace in the k plus 1 dimensional space spanned by these vectors, uh, these, these vectors. Let's take the trace of R h in this space. Okay. This is a much more elegant proof, uh, which will be again more use, usable in higher dimensional, uh, more complicated Lie algebras. Okay. But on the other hand, so let's compute that. But we know what this is. Uh, this is uh, this is a, this is the sum over that, right? So j plus j minus one plus all the way up to j minus k. Right? This is the uh, so the, the, for each state because R h is diagonal in this basis. R h is diagonal. What is R h? R h I can write as a matrix k plus one by k plus one matrix where I choose this as a basis. So my basis vectors are phi h w. Uh, all the way up to this basis, R e minus k, phw. Right? So I choose this as my basis. So we know these are these are eigen uh, these are all eigen functions. So in this basis, R h is diagonal, with the, the uh, diagonal entries being uh, j j minus one all the way up to j minus k. Okay. That's it. So the trace of that is simply this sum. But that sum is. Uh, uh, so uh, let's see. So altogether, J appears K plus one times, right? The, 
these terms, there are k plus 1 guys here, right? So this appears k plus 1 times. So this is nothing else but uh, k plus 1 times j, the first term. Then this sum, so minus, let's say, m, m going from 1 up to k, right? Which is, uh, so, this, so this, this of course remains the same, k plus 1 times j. And this one is k plus k times k plus 1 over 2, right? So which we, again, we get the same thing. You get, I can take out k plus 1 over 2 as a common factor. You get here 2j minus, 2j minus k. Okay. That, is, that is fine, but we'll, how do we know that this should be 0? Right? The, the, I mean, when you set this to 0, that is when you get k equal to 2j. And therefore, the dimension being k plus uh, 2j plus 1, because dimension plus k plus 1, right? Uh, these are k plus 1 vectors, k plus 1 dimension. Okay. So somehow, if you can prove that this had to be 0, right? Uh, that comes follows from the following fact, that Re plus, uh, uh, that Rh was nothing else but 1 half of the commutator of Re plus R e minus. Okay. Therefore, this trace, this trace that we are talking about on the left hand side is one half of the commutator of R e plus R e minus. Okay. But the trace of any commutator is zero. Right? So this had to be zero. So that's, uh, that is another way of getting the same result. Here we explicitly get the numbers which appear when you apply the raising operator, right? Uh, here. Uh, uh, there we just use the fact that Rh is a commutator of two generators. Okay? And see, all, these are all, uh, all there's a representation here. So these are all k plus 1 by k plus 1 matrices, right? In this representation. Okay. So in, when you take the trace of the commutator of two matrices, it's zero. Because uh, trace is cyclic, no? trace has cyclic property. Okay, so that's the proof uh, of the dimension. So the, the because of this now, uh, so you see that if k is two j, then uh, this goes from j j minus one up up to minus j, right? So since we already know k is two j, the eigenvalues are. Eigenvalues are so this is 2j, right? So this goes up to minus j. So this is a complete symmetry. For every positive eigenvalue, there's a negative eigenvalue. So j, j, and minus j, j minus 1, and the minus of that. No? So, so the whole thing is equally spread. That is why, because for every positive, there's a negative. That's why the trace is vanishing, right? Well, I mean, certainly that's an easy way to make the trace Spanish. Okay, any question on this? Uh, let's... Uh, the trace of the power of H is zero, mainly because of the commutation, but this doesn't have anything to do with the fact that H was initially traces, because H was like sigma 3. Sigma 3 is, uh, was traces, and so after we made the, the mapping to R of H, yeah. this doesn't mean that the trace should be again. It's not obvious to begin with, right? I mean, it's not immediately yeah. obvious, but uh, it turns out that that is the case. Is the trace invariant under this uh, representation, all of which? Not uh, necessarily. I mean, no, the, that is not obvious. I mean, the crucial part was the, this commutator, the fact that it is a commutator. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, that is, of course, inside there. In, in the, that uh, algebra, you have it. I mean, any representation will satisfy the algebra. That is clear, right? And so you can use the algebra, but not the specific form of the sigma matrix. The only thing you can use the algebra. Okay. Um, and uh, think about it. Uh, let's wait for a bit and let's uh, you think and see if there's any question. Because uh, it's very important that you understand this completely, uh, absolutely well.
Now you can, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so given this uh, thing, I mean, you can, uh, we have chose this basis, right? So in this basis now, you can write down explicitly what these are. What are, what are these? These are all going to be some matrices, right, in that basis. You can write down explicitly, well, Rh is that, that is clear. What about Re plus and Re minus? Well, that, um, yeah, that, um, so that we already, so unfortunately I erased that formula, the, which we had, we had an L explicitly appearing there, right, for an arbitrary L. But, uh, so what you do then is, um, is, so if Re plus acts on, mm, is that, yeah. so if Re plus acts on uh, the states, what is it going to do? It's going to push it, push you one step up, right? Each guy. So you will get R E plus will be a matrix, uh, which will be uh, so if it if it acts on this state, it should push you up, right? So it should be diagonal will not be zero, right? The only off diagonal will be either one up, one one line parallel to the diagonal up or down, right? So. So we are saying that the, the, this element is moved up, right? So that means here it will be something non-zero, right? Because when I apply this, this element goes up, right? So here is everything is zero, and here you get some non-zero numbers just at the one diagonal up, right? and then everything else zero here. This is a structure by the R plus. Now the precise coefficients we can determine with, uh, by the formula which I just erased before. Before the way we had a uh, formula with the L explicitly, right? So any, if you look at the Lf guy, uh, it will go to L minus 1th guy with that particular combination of the coefficient, right? But remember that coefficient was real, right? There was some more complicated expression which involved J and L and everything, right? But whatever it is, these numbers are real. And the form of the matrix is the, uh, the only line, only place where it is non-zero is the one diagonal up. Uh, I mean, one diagonal, uh, you, you understand what I mean. One, uh, uh, this is not a row, but okay, just about the, you know, one step about the diagonal. Hmm? That is Re plus. Re minus, on the other hand, takes you down one step, right? So if this will be uh, something which will be uh, diagonal or zero, Upper things are all zero, and the lower thing, just one line below the diagonal, this will be non zero. Okay. And then here again, zero. Okay. In fact, in this basis, in this basis that we are using, uh, uh, this one just goes to one times the next one. Right? So actually, in this basis, these are all one, one, one. But the, the price for choosing such a basis, uh, these numbers are more complicated. This were uh, that complicated expression I wrote down, right? Okay, uh, so this uh, doesn't look like uh, Hermitian stage, right? Because remember, uh, the, we wrote uh, the, six, uh, okay, I can erase this part here. This doesn't look Hermitian. Uh, on the other hand, we would have expected something like this because, after all, sigma plus uh, and sigma minus were Hermitian to each other, right? Hermitian conjugative. Because see, this was sigma 1 plus i sigma 2, and this is sigma 1 minus i sigma 2. So, this should be Hermitian to each other. Yeah? So, you would expect that uh, if I take the Hermitian conjugate of this, I should get that. And vice versa. That is simply because the reason why we, we don't manifestly see this is because these guys don't have the same norm. These have different norms. Okay. So this is Hermitian with respect to that norm which exists here. But if you want to visibly, I mean explicitly see that it is like Hermitian, these are Hermitian matrices, what you should do is to normalize them. No? If you normalize them to the same norm, all of them, then, uh, then it will be Hermitian. Okay. And the way you define the norm, 
So if I take uh, R e minus any generic state, R e minus phi h w uh, to the L, then the Hermitian conjugate of that state, I mean, let's suppose initial phi h w has been normalized to 1. The initial, that is what our starting point was, right? Suppose it has been normalized to 1. Right? Now, when I look at this, the norm of this state will be, uh, will be simply uh, phi h w dagger and r e plus to the l. Okay. And then you, so you want this also to be normalized, so this should be 1. So that means that I should, it will not be 1 actually, because you can see that to, to do this calculation, so I, if I want to do this calculation, what I have to do? I have to start moving this re plus step by step to the there, all the way across, because then I know this is the highest weight, so re plus will annihilate it. But in that process, you have to keep using this multiple commutators. And that you have to do with each re plus. So it's a long calculation, okay? But at the end of the day, it's fairly obvious already from the previous calculations, you'll get some very complicated numbers, which will depend on J and L, right? We do have the result when one R E plus goes so can we use that result? Sure, sure. You have to then you have to multiple times you have to use. Yeah. Correct, correct. So uh, for one uh, thing you have uh, so once we remove one of, move one of them across, so what is left over here is L minus one. And this guy has become <coughs> our E minus to the L minus one because you know in moving this across with that number which I which I erase unfortunately. That you know that uh, which is a function of J and L, some quadratic in L and so on, right? this number, which was there. So, uh, and then you do again next time uh, and keep going. So then the, at the end there will be a sum over L also. Because these numbers will depend on both J and L, no? The next time it will be uh, J, so the next time it will be N J L minus 1 and so on, no? So there will be a summation also there. So it's fairly, I mean, rather complicated. Uh, not too complicated. I think you can do it in one sheet of paper if you have half an hour. <laughs> Not half an hour, 20 minutes or so, you can work it out. Uh, but um, so you'll get some number, and then you can take that, uh, the, just uh, renormalize it. I mean, normalize it by square root of that number. No? Uh, then, in that basis, so when you use that, so suppose I've normalized these guys, okay, this is already normalized, the next one, uh, R e minus phi h w, this will have some normalization, and so on. Each one will have some normalization. Okay? Now you see these numbers are not going to be this and that, no? Because every time, uh, so this one moves down, uh, the normalizations of this state and this state are different. These are L and J dependent, right? So these numbers are going to be different. So it is true that when I apply R e plus, uh, R e minus, uh, this guy goes to the R e minus square phi h. But these numbers are not going to go this to this thing because this is L dependent, right? So this will not be one, this will be some complicated numbers. Okay. And similarly, this will be some complicated numbers, but in that basis, you will see that these are Hermitian conjugate with each other. Okay. So, it, so the fact that you don't manage in the original basis, it was not Hermitian, is not a problem. It is just that they are not in the same norm. That's the reason why it was not, not manifestly Hermitian. They were Hermitian, but uh, it was hidden. Okay. It, it, it would be Hermitian with that metric, which is there, with those the norms, which are different norms. So uh, that was just uh, one remark. Um, we will not need that. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, uh, we will not need the details of that. It's just, uh, yeah, uh, these numbers are not so important for us. Uh, <coughs> uh, so the other thing is that what we see is that irrespective of this, uh, we can keep it the same way, it doesn't matter. Important point is that these are all real, right? Real coefficients here. Okay. Um, so now if I look at, remember E plus minus were E1 plus minus I E2. Okay. So R um, uh, R E1 is nothing else because it's a linear map. Remember, it's a linear map. E1 is simply uh, E plus plus E minus divided by 2, right? So this is half R E plus uh, E1 
E1 meaning sigma one, uh, sigma one by two. I don't know. T, oh, I think we were calling T1, right? This is T1. Sorry. This T1 plus I T2. No. These T's were sigma by three. So, uh, so this is like R T1 plus uh, R T2 divided by two, and R E2 is one over two I R T1 minus R T2. Um, uh, no, sorry. What am I saying? R T1 is R E plus plus R E minus, and this is R E plus minus R E minus. Okay. This is T2, T1, and T2. Okay. In the, in the second, R E plus minus R E plus minus minus. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we are seeing is that. Uh, R T1 is purely real, R T1 is purely imaginary, R T2 is purely imaginary. R T3 is of course, R T3 was the what we call R H, right? T3, that is of course real. I mean that was this eigen diagonal and with eigenvalues. This was the eigenvalues, right? J going on to minus J. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, what we were calling H was sigma 3 or sigma 3 by 2? Sigma 3 by 2. So, T3 is also, also sigma 3 by 2. Uh, so, it should be. Um, I mean, this J is in, can be integer and half integer. You see, because the formula was 2J was equal to K. Uh, 2J was equal to K, right? Now, K has to be an integer. So, that means that J can be integer. So yeah, if, if j is equal to half, then it will be plus half to minus half, okay, which is sigma three by two itself, right? Because uh, for, for uh, j equal to half, you get back the original representatives, poly matrices themselves, okay. which is not manifest here. That is simply because the normalization is not correct. It is not one. Huh? For, in other words, for j equal to uh, j equal to half, k. Uh, k is 1, so dimension is k plus 1, so dimension is 2. So these are all 2 by 2 matrices. Right? And you will see that they are basically the same as poly matrices. Uh, I mean, sigma plus, sigma minus, and sigma 3. But it won't, may not be manifest because these numbers may not be the same. The number here is not, may not be the same as that number. That is because we have different normalization. But if you normalize correctly, it will be the same. Uh, yeah, so so these are all, I think T, T's are sigmas by 2. T, T R A is equal to sigma A by 2. And then, so this is T3. So if, yeah, if J is half, we plus half and minus half, which is sigma 3 by 2. Okay. Um, So that is this thing. Um, what else I have to say here? Let's see. Ah, I have to introduce a, uh, this is just for the future. I mean, just to remember that. Uh, I, will I mean, come back to it. Uh, that um, in this representation, in the way we have constructed the representations, uh, the RT1 is pure real, RT2 is pure imaginary, and RT3 is uh, also real. This is a feature of that, of the way we have constructed the presentations. Now the other concept, if you have no other question, so let me just mention one more concept here, which is called the invariance. Okay. So question is, can I construct some invariants, uh, which are invariants made up of the, of the T's, huh? T's or sigma, you know, uh, which says that uh, it is uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it commutes with the Lie algebra. Okay. That is the question we are asking. And this is what these are called Casimirs. Such, if you can find these invariants, they are called Casimir invariants. Casimir invariants. Okay. For SC two, in fact, it turns out there is only one independent Casimir. Okay. Uh, so for SU2, it turns out that uh, there is only one uh, independent 
Okay? Here I don't mean linear reading. Okay. Uh, I mean uh, any polynomial of Casimir. Uh, because I mean if I found one Casimir, if I take the square of it, that's also invariant, right? Square, cube, or anything, so any polynomial of that. So statement is that any invariant can be written as a polynomial of this Casimir. Function, a function of Casimir. Yeah. Not necessarily just a linear, it can be anything. Huh? Um, so the, the, this is something you can try to do, that you can show that the, this Casimir, I call this C, and let me put here C2. Right. C2 because it turns, out, uh, it turns out it's quadratic. So it is simply TATA, sum the value. This is the quadratic Casimir. Um, and uh, you can explicitly check that uh, because uh, so I mean so C two in the R th representation uh, it will be simply R T A times R T A. Okay. So this is uh, some matrix. This is a matrix. Let's take the product and sum over A. Hmm? That's okay. And so to to show that this commutes with everything. So let's try to show that. Uh, the C2 is simply because the 2, 2 index, I'm using just because it's quadratic in the generators, right? Uh, you will see that for higher algebras, SU3, for example, there are two Casimirs. One of them is quadratic, other is cubic. So then, the, so there's another one which is C3, and they're independent. C3, you cannot write it in terms of C2. Uh, so yeah. How do you consider Casimir invariants? Uh, so, I mean, here you just explicitly work it out and uh, show. Yes, but what would be the generic way to consider it? Uh, uh, that's a bit complicated, but uh, you can uh, uh, generally sh uh, argue that there are so many independent Casimirs. The number you can count. Oh. How many independent Casimirs should be. Mm. Okay. How is it related with the degree of the group? Um, uh, uh, not the degree, it, it is related to the, mm -hmm. uh, the Cartan's algebra, essentially. Oh, okay. the, uh, yeah, the number of, uh, the dimension of the Cartan's algebra. Here, the, the uh, Cartan's algebra is only one, is one dimensional, right? Cartan's algebra was only the sigma 3, so generated by sigma 3, right? Uh -huh. So it was one dimensional. So SUT would be V2 because of the... Two dimensional. Okay. Cartan's algebra will be two dimensional. Yes, SUT. As you fold it to be three dimensional and so on. Huh? Why do you call it invariants? Do you invariant do what? Uh, under the, the commutes to the Lie algebra, that's what oh, okay. I'm saying. So it if, it, uh, if it commutes to the Lie algebra, then it, uh, of course, is grouping variant also, right? Because of the exponentiation of exactly. the Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So to, to prove that, so we want to check, we want to check if R of uh, uh, this uh, RTA, RT, any T, T, A, let's say, does it commute with the C2? So this is what we want to check. So is it zero? That, uh, so maybe, should, is it a, a homework problem or not? Indeed, this is a homework problem. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not, I mean, uh, it's not difficult. You just uh, use the SU2 algebra. No, it's kind of like that when we learn in quantum mechanics that... Uh, you did that. Yeah, yeah. 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 you did that. Precisely, you did that, yeah. I think you, all of you have done it. So, but just do it again. So, so uh, uh, okay, so if we accept this, uh, then uh, you can ask, uh, so a given representation, what is the value of this? This is a number, right, in a given representation. If I apply this, if I apply this on any state, on a, on a, on a, on a particularly reducible representation, irreducible representation, if that's important, irreducible, yeah. Okay. If I act this on the reducible representation, this operator should be some number, let's say alpha, times the identity matrix. Right? This is guaranteed. Why? Because since it commutes with the, all the generators, sure. now let's suppose I, at the, on the highest weight state it has some value. When you apply it, uh, you found some number. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Then uh, any other state I can obtain by applying R e minuses. Right? Enough number of R e minuses. But this R e minuses commute with them. That means the value, eigenvalue of this guy for all of these states is going to be the same. Right? That is why it's going to be some number, this number, whatever the eigenvalue of the first state was, highest weight state was, it will be the same value for all of them. Right? Because, uh, so therefore it is going to be proportional to identity matrix. This alpha will of course depend on which, which, represent, which irreducible representation you are working with. If you had started with a different irreducible representation, this alpha will be different, but again it will be an identity matrix. Because it is irreducible. You know, every, every irreducible, yeah. If you have a reducible representation, of course, then it will not be proportional to identity. Yeah. You have to split the reducible representation to irreducible blocks. Yeah. Okay. Then in each of those blocks, it will be identity. Yeah. But uh, because these numbers are different. So let's just check uh, for a spin J representation. So let's just check for spin J. This is called spin J representation. The one, uh, so this. Remember this uh, highest weight state, uh, we said R of uh, t, uh, H, which is the same as T3, uh, was acting on this was simply J times V, right? This was, this was the definition of J. J was the uh, uh, T3 eigenvalue for the highest weight. Uh, so this is the, the, the representation that you construct, irreducible representation you construct from this highest weight is called the spin J representation. And we saw it starts from j up to minus j, right? In units of one, it goes like that. No? Spin j representation. So in the spin j representation, uh, you can uh, evaluate this uh, thing here, uh, and that can be done by rewriting. Uh, okay, let me just use this. Uh, you can rewrite this guy sum over t a t a as a uh, in terms of those uh, things that we use, introduce h and e plus and e minus. Uh, this can be written as h square plus half e plus e minus plus e minus e plus. Okay. You can, it's not easy because e plus, we can check that. e plus e minus was simply, uh, so t1 plus minus i t2, right? So when I take this plus that, you will get t1 square two times uh, because there's one t1 square coming from here and the t1 square coming from there and similarly to t2 square uh, and then the cross term uh, will cancel out the cross term between this and that okay. when you add the two things it will cancel out so you just get that two two cancel with that this is already t3 square h was the same as t3 so this is t3 square plus t1 square plus t2 square. That was the original expression. Yeah. Now, I don't get why this vector has to be an irreducible. Uh, which one? Which one? Uh, we said that uh, uh, c1 acted by, uh, on a vector which is an uh, irreducible representation that reduces the identity matrix. Only an irreducible representation. Or an irreducible. Why? I didn't get why. Because for different irreducible representations, this number alpha is different. Sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so if, if it's uh, in a reducible representation, I will get like identities on the block diagrams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, the numbers are different. Yeah. Alpha, alpha are different. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so this, this all of you accept, right? I mean, this is simple. Just plug it, plug this in here. And uh, the important thing is to show that the cross terms cancel okay. when you add these two terms. So once you accept that, then uh, I can rewrite this again. Um, uh, you see, uh, I can write, uh, remember this uh, E plus was the one which was appearing in the, in the definition of highest weight, right? R E plus acting on VHW was zero, right? So well, let's try to bring E plus to the right, right? So this is already on the right, because we want to apply this operator on some state, right? And it, we are going to apply on VHW. Because we know it's enough to just compute it on THW, right? So let's apply this. We want to apply this there. So what we do is we just uh, use the commutator again. No? So this guy I can write it as a commutator. This one, e plus e minus, and then uh, uh, so uh, plus 
e minus e, uh, plus e plus, right? This I can write like that. This guy. So the whole thing becomes h square plus half commutator of e plus e minus. And then uh, this adds up to two factors, so this removes. So you get here e minus e plus. This uh, is nothing, I'm just uh, using the commutation relation so far. Huh? But on the other hand, this we know is 2h, right? So 2 cancels with that, so this is nothing else but h square plus h plus e minus e plus. Okay. Now, if you let's apply this on phw. So that means the, this is the collapse, right? So this will be acting on this, uh, any representation is going to be r h square plus r h plus r e minus times r e plus, right? This is what the expression is. Now I apply this on phi h w, highest rate. This vanishes. r h eigenvalue was j, r h square is j square. So this is simply j times j plus one. So this number, this thing is simply j times j plus one. So alpha in the spin j representation, this is spin j representation, this alpha is j times j plus one. Which is what uh, you remember from the quantum mechanics. Uh, this sum over t square, sum over t a square, uh, t a are the angular momentum generators, right? So t a sum over t a square is j square, the full j square, right? Uh, j is the angular momentum. Uh, and its eigenvalue, you remember from the quantum mechanics course, was j times j plus 1 okay. for a spin j representation. Of course, in the context that you were looking at, you were looking at uh, uh, only the j was integer, right? Because orbital angular momentum are integer. No? So, but uh, what I'm saying here is that more generally, j can be half integer. Now let me just uh, conclude the, uh, one more comment, uh, which relates to the some statements I made last time, uh, like the last lecture. Um, uh, so, and that is, uh, so remember we mentioned about the the center of the group, center of SU two, or of any group, but in particular, let's look at SU two. The center of SU2 is Z2. This is not in the notes. Eh? I mean, in the notes, we never mentioned about center. But uh, just uh, for your I mean, just knowledge. So this Z2 uh, has just two elements. Of course, one is the identity element, which is 1, 0, 0, 1. They're two by two matrix. Eh? And the other element is minus identity. So minus 1, 0, 0, 1. These are both, both elements are in SU2. And, uh, and the important point is that these elements commute with every element of SU2, right? This is because proportional to identity, so of course it commutes, right? So it commutes. And uh, I mentioned to you that uh, the uh, eigenvalue of this operator, I mean, how it acts, how these uh, two operators act on any given representation. Uh, so remember this Z2 is uh, generally, uh, we, were, we said that this is generated by the identity and omega, right? Where omega identity, uh, I don't remember I was using E or some other symbol for identity. Maybe we're using, so this is the identity. Every group has to have an identity. And there is one more, only one other element. So it must be the inverse of itself, right? Because we know that inverse must also exist. So it must be the inverse of itself. And indeed, omega square is identity. So which means omega inverse is omega. So this is Z2. So omega, uh, abstractly, already from this relation you see, omega can have only two values, possible values. One or minus one. The eigenvalues, I mean, on any state. If I apply this operator, it can only have eigenvalue plus one or minus one. But moreover, uh, you see, this, this commutes to the every element of the group, right? Which means that in a given representation, it will have just omega will have just one specific eigenvalue. Because after all, starting irreducible representation. In a given irreducible representation, after all, like if I start from one state 
I can get to any other state by applying the group, SV2 group elements, right? Uh, so therefore, and since SV2 group elements commute with these elements, in particular with omega, so eigenvalues of omega will be the same in, for all the states in a given irreducible representation. Okay. So that's the thing. So, so let us uh, now. What is this element minus one? You see, I could uh, write this the way when we were writing in terms of exponentiation of the Lie, uh, Lie algebra generators, right? I could write this as e to the power of um, i pi sigma three. This uh, I can write uh, because any uh, any element can be written as a uh, exponential of i times some coefficient times sigma dot sigma. No, you can write that. So in particular, let's look at this i pi dot sigma three. Uh, well, this is nothing else but uh, uh, sigma three is one minus one. So this is just going to be minus one minus one because it's e to the i pi. I mean, this is e to the i pi, and this is e to the minus i pi. But it uh, doesn't matter. Both of them are minus one, right? And so this is the minus one, minus one. So this is indeed omega. This is what we call omega, right? So r of omega, r meaning in a given representation, how omega acts, I can deduce from simply e to the power of i pi r sigma three. But R sigma 3, I know what it is. In a spin j representation, uh, this is nothing else but exponential i pi. And this matrix is start uh, is j, j minus 1, up to minus j. It's diagonal. Right. So it, it, it just becomes, uh, oh no, sorry, this sigma 3. Uh, so this is two times that, right? Because this was t3. This was sigma 3 by 2. So it is 2 i pi. Yeah, because this was the t3. But t3 was sigma 3 by 2. So r sigma 3 is 2 times this matrix. Is that, is that clear? Mm -hmm. So this is nothing else but e to the 2 pi i j, e to the 2 pi i j minus 1, all the way 2 pi i. Uh, times all the way to the 2 pi i minus j. Right? This matrix, everything else is zero. But now, uh, of course, you see that, uh, of course, this minus 1, uh, I mean, any integer, this uh, 2 pi i times an integer is irrelevant. Hmm? So you, you see that this whole thing is e to the 2 pi i j times i of t matrix. Correct. Because these are all just shifting j by integers, no? But when I shift by integer, integer times e to the 2 pi, e to the 2 pi i times integer is 1. Right? So, is that clear? So, so everything is going to be equal to e to the 2 pi i j. So, it's e to the 2 pi i j times identity, which is what we expect. This r omega should be proportional by identity on each representation, right? By general argument. Because since omega commutes with every element, the center of the group, right? And in a reducible representation, I can get any state from another state, right? By applying the group elements, no? Group elements or Lie algebra elements are the same thing, the infinitesimal versions. So, so the group group will keep the state. I mean, take you from one state to another state. So they must all have the same eigenvalue under omega, because omega commutes with every group element. So, and, what we, and we here see what is the eigenvalue. Eigenvalue is this, you see. So what it is telling me is that for j integers, this is plus 1. For j half integers, it is minus 1. That is what we see here. So the value of omega, so r omega uh, acting on uh, j equal to integer, so it, it, it is equal to plus 1 or minus 1, plus identity or minus identity. This is for j equal to integer. And here j equal to integer plus half. 
it is minus one. Okay. Um, now re remember that these two elements were mapped to the identity of SO3. Right? Right. Now, uh, in quantum mechanics, the things that you were doing were S was SO3, not SU2. Right? It was a rotation group in three dimensions. That was SO3. Okay. So, in, in those, so in, in those representations, I mean, so what I'm saying is that that was SO3. So therefore, both of these guys are mapped to the identity of SO3. Right? And identity of SO3 should have only eigenvalue plus one yeah. on any state, not minus one, yeah. right? So you see that. So therefore, uh, since both, so both of them should give you eigenvalue plus one mm -hmm. in the context of SO3, right? But that can happen if J is integer, and that is why in the quantum mechanics course you, you had J was always integer. You see, the orbital angular momentums which are just the rotation, which is the rotation generators in the three-dimensional space, those are integers. Okay. But SU2 is, a, SU2 is essentially a, a double cover of SO3, because two points go to one point, right? Uh, very specific, explicitly, so you can think of this, SU2 uh, group space was S3, three-dimensional sphere, right? The SO3 group space is not S3, it is S3 mod Z3, mod Z3, which is basically like uh, identifying antipodal points. No? Okay, S3 is difficult to imagine, but we can imagine S2, right? I mean, we can picture S2 in, the, in our minds. No? Uh, so in S2, a similar map would be where the opposite points are identified. So North Pole is identified with South Pole. So every opposite point is identified. You don't count them twice. Is one. So the, sim the generalization of that for S3. So you, you identify the two points, which are exactly the opposite to each other. If you draw a, a, a line passing through the center, then this line is going to intersect. You know, uh, so the opposite points. To, uh, to. Yeah. So that. Um, So, strictly speaking, in SO3, you should not get integer, half integer representations. For SO3, you should only get integer splits. If you go to the double cover of SO3 and come here to S3, SO, SU2, then you have both, both the representations. It, it, it's, um, yeah, um, I mean, the, the, this is what happens. Um, uh, when you in introduce spinners in the theory. When you have uh, spinners in the theory, then uh, you don't demand that when you rotate by 2 pi, the state comes back, the field comes back to itself. It you know, comes back to minus itself. And in, in that case, you double, uh, you, uh, SO3 becomes kind of, uh, you have to go to the double cover of SO3, which is in fact SU2. This is not the same as going to O3. Uh, remember, this is this double doubling is not that. I mean, O3 also is doubling of SO3, but in a different way, right? Determinant equal to minus one. These are two disconnected copies, but that is that doubling is not the same as this doubling. This doubling is, uh, you see, after you double that, you get S3, but this is a connected space. Every, any two points are connected to each other by, you can draw a line from one point to another point, staying on the S3, right? So it's connected, they're not dis, disjoint sets. Whereas in O3, these two spaces, determinant plus one and determinant minus one, you simply cannot go in between, right? You cannot connect it with the curve because this discrete, determinant plus one, determinant minus one. If you want to draw a curve, then determinant must vary slowly from minus one to plus one. But there is no such thing. You have only determinant minus one or plus one. So this, these two spaces are disconnected. No? But here it is not. So this doubling is different doubling. Okay, so I think maybe I'll just stop here and we'll continue next time. There is one or two topics we still have to, no, actually it's not much. I have to talk about the complex representations. There, this question of the way, I, this mention of uh, real and pure imaginary 
could be useful. Uh, so complex representations and after that tensor product. So, so I hope uh, by Monday I should be able to finish SU2. Monday, uh, uh, to Monday and then, then we go to SU3. Okay, see you. Ah, let's see this. <laughs>